Hi everyone, uh, thank you for coming. My name is Alex, I work in SmartDeck. Hi, and today I will tell about one of our creations, ERC20 test suite, and how it helps in achieving the decentralized security. Uh, to start with, a couple of words about SmartDeck. Uh, so we've been working in the area of application security for maybe 10 years now, and the five years of those we are creating application security tools, both for small businesses and big enterprise businesses. And in the area of blockchain security, we performed more than 200 blockchain audits. And uh, of course, we create uh, a number of smart contract security tools. And during our work in blockchain, uh, we encountered the following problem. Uh, many blockchain projects, like some dApps or exchanges, deal with tokens. And most of those tokens are meant to be ERC-20 compliant. But the sad truth is that most of them are not. Uh, currently, if you run uh, some, su some of such projects, uh, for you there are only two approaches to ensure the ERC-20 compatibility. It's either ordering a third-party code audit or writing a bunch of tests. So uh, both of these approaches take long time, they are expensive, they need certain degree of trust, and of course they are not scalable. So according to our vision, uh, if you work in a project that deals with any counterparty interfaces, that need to comply to some requirements, you need to have a way to check this compliance in a decentralized way. So as a first step in achieving this vision, we created uh, the tool that we named ERC20 Test Suite. Basically, it's a dApp. It runs tests on chain, it saves the results on chain, and it is completely trustless since it's a smart contract. It has simple web interface, but it can be used via a smart contract. Uh, so I will show you how it looks like. Uh, so the process is really easy. It has only three steps. You enter the address of token. You approve 1,000 token units in order to perform some checks. And uh, please know that all of those tokens will be refunded to you. And on step, three, on step three, you click yes, okay, please check this token. And after a couple of minutes, uh, after the transaction, transaction is mined, uh, you see the result. It's basically it's a list of properties grouped by type, and they are color coded uh, to show whether the concrete property is uh, violated or not. So the same results are written. Uh, on chain and can be accessed uh, by any smart contract at any time. So what do we get? Uh, we get low price. Uh, you pay only for gas. Uh, the process is fully automated uh, because no people involved at any moment. Uh, and uh, those tests are really easy to run. You saw it. And uh, the results are easy to understand and easy to show to anyone. And not to say that we achieve trustlessness. So please go and try it. It's uh, online. It's testsuit.net, and uh, also we open sourced it, and uh, it can be it can be uh, found on GitHub. So you can play with it and uh, maybe uh, change it according to your needs. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Tim Bago. I'm here to talk about how we can fund ETH 1.x by auctioning off the names to Ethereum network upgrades. So, a bit of background. Um, there's some initiatives on Ethereum 1.0 and Ethereum 1.x that don't need the fund, that don't get the funds they need to get off the ground. And oftentimes the amount needed for these initiatives are quite small to basically to build a proof of concept, to get to an initial EAP and something like that. So I think we could fund some of these efforts by auctioning off the names to network upgrades. So what I mean specifically is I think we should, could run an on-chain auction from the first block of an upgrade all the way to the last block of it before the next one. And throughout the auction, people bid for what the name of the upgrade will be. Um, 
and this kind of a dynamic auction, so throughout the auction, whatever the highest bid says the name is, is what we refer to uh, the upgrade as for that time, uh, for that point in time. Um, and obviously, whenever someone outbids that bid, then you refund the previous bird person, update the name, uh, and that's it. And there's a couple of things that are important here. The first is that you'd want to have like a high minimum bid uh, because this is premium namespace you're selling, you want to make sure that uh, people value it accordingly. So I'd propose a thousand ETH minimum. Um, and you also want to have large increments between the bids because you don't want people to spam the network uh, while they're making bids for, for these names. Uh, so I had a proposal for 100 ETH. Um, and this would obviously be a bit complicated on the client side because if they need to change the name all the time, that's not ideal. So we could just use version numbers in the clients and use a uh, marketing name uh, that we use sort of in blog posts and whatnot, uh, kind of like Android does where all the major releases have both a marketing name and a version number. And so on the upgrade block, whatever the highest bid says the name is gets finalized on chain and that's how we refer to the upgrade uh, going forward in time. And what do you actually fund here? So I think we should use these funds and try to spend them on initiatives that have a high likelihood of improving the Ethereum network today. Um, this means things like new uh, syncing and discovery protocols, some better testing, some ETH 1.x initiatives like state rent, some coordination across the clients, or even some research ideas like off-chain storage. And Again, it's important to note that we should try to optimize to have a large set of initiatives, so have fairly small amounts that are kind of proof of concept size um, that are spent fairly quickly. So in an ideal world, you've spent almost all of the funds from one auction before uh, starting the next one. But who gets to decide how we spend those funds? Um, proposal for this is a three out of five multi-sig with the following parties. So you'd have uh, someone who's there to represent the Ethereum Foundation, who's not a client developer, who's really there to represent sort of the Ethereum brand and vision. Uh, you'd want to have two client developers, ideally one or more, not from the EF, uh, who are there to represent the core devs. Um, and then you'd want also an independent protocol developer, so someone who's not affiliated with one of the bigger companies in the space. And finally, someone to represent the broader community. So someone who's not part of the EF, who's not a core developer, uh, but just represents the Ethereum community at large, whether they're a DAP developer, an Ethereum cat herder, or just some Reddit or Twitter user who's very favorable towards Ethereum. Um, and the people on these multi-sig would basically be able to rotate in and out on a per upgrade basis. So you're not signing up to this for life. Uh, this obviously implies you need a process to decide how you add or remove people from that multi-sig. Um, and there's a couple constraints on, on, on the people in that multi-sig. Uh, specifically that you don't want them to be able to get grants from the auction if they're part of the multi-sig. And even farther than that, you probably don't want anyone from the organizations to apply for a grant if they control the keys to the funds. Um, so for example, if Besu, which is the team that I'm on was part of the multi-sig for Berlin, which is the next upgrade after Istanbul, then no one from Pegasus, which is the company I work for, should be able to apply for a grant for funds from funds raised during that auction. Um, and so one interesting question here is like, what do you actually name the hard fork? Uh, so I have a couple proposals for what would be okay or not okay for names. Uh, obviously this is something you'd want to prove by the community and you'd want to discuss. Um, and more specifically, you probably want to have a process where at least one person on a multi-sig has to approve of a name for a bit to be valid. Um, so some couple ideas of what's okay, just like some generic words. You don't want bad stuff, no offensive stuff. Uh, and probably just like not anything confusing, so no previous upgrade names, uh, no other blockchain names, so it would be kind of awkward if you had like the ETC Ethereum upgrade. Um, and generally, like something that you would be okay sponsoring DEF CON, would probably be a good, a good name there. Uh, and finally, if you don't raise any money during this auction, then we could just revert back to using DEF CON city names, which is what we started doing informally past Istanbul. Um, so that's what I had. Uh, I have like a minute left if anyone has a question. Okay, thanks everybody. Hello everyone. <laughs> Uh, this is Human Farhman. I'm with Gartner. So in this session, I want to share with you some end user perspective, you know, that hopefully help with the adoption. So uh, we have, uh, we basically service, you know, thousands of inquiries per year, you know, that uh, relates to blockchain and pretty much half of them uh, deals with, you know, selecting a blockchain platform. Uh, in many cases, we'll see there's a still a lot of confusion that, that what a 
blockchain platform is or is not. So, uh, <clears throat> and that really uh, play into um, uh, the adoption and, and the ease of, you know, uh, evaluating your platform. So, um, uh, there are many, um, there are many uh, different definitions, you know, that we find out, you know, uh, unfortunately, some of them really doesn't make sense. And it, we have to spend a lot of time, you know, for companies to, first of all, define a blockchain platform, what it constitutes, and uh, take the next step to uh, start comparing uh, the platform which is out there and, and select something that works for them. So uh, from what we have seen, obviously, uh, uh, Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric are the most popular one, but I have to say that there is no loyalty to any of these platforms because it's still most of the organizations are testing, you know, and, and going through proof of concepts. Uh, or some sort of limited pilot, so the, any decision that they uh, make uh, is not really a strategic one, so in a couple of years or one year, you know, uh, they may switch to another platform. So what we thought, you know, it may help is to start establishing a functional framework for blockchain platforms, you know, that uh, helps with uh, organizations to do an apple-to-apple -apple comparison of different uh, frameworks or platforms out there, uh, which there are hundreds of them, uh, they initially come to us and say, okay, why don't you, as a Gartner, go create a magic quadrant, you know, for, um, for all of these platforms. The challenge is that there are so many of them out there, so, uh, and then they are changing too fast in terms of, you know, uh, uh, all the improvements that are happening. So it's kind of work in progress. So that's not possible. So what we did instead, we created this uh, framework that pretty much covers uh, uh, all the key functional modules from the smart contracts, node management, the core blockchain uh, transactions, infrastructure, and uh, more and more the ecosystem uh, management aspect of uh, uh, blockchain solution. So, so basically the idea is that this is not obviously perfect, you know, we are gonna improve it over time, but the idea is that First of all, they get an understanding what a platform uh, is, and then they start asking the right questions. So <clears throat> for every of these functional modules, we define you know, what it is, you know, and then we introduce some questions that they should ask. Um, so if you add them up, it's about 142 questions you know, that pretty much covers you know, uh, all the key important, you know, features that you may expect uh, from a platform. Some of them uh, may be applicable or not applicable, uh, depending to the use case that they have. And uh, that will give them hopefully an understanding that, for example, what's the difference if they go with, uh, let's say, Ethereum versus uh, Hedera versus Fabric, Corda, uh, and some of the differences, you know, will come up, you know, as, as part of that process, you know. Um, but the story doesn't change, uh, doesn't end there. Uh, what we have to deal with, you know, there's a lot of debates around public versus, you know, enterprise. We, we see those are the two key uh, patterns in terms of the design of these platforms. Uh, we, we see sometimes uh, people try to differentiate these platforms in a much more granular way. But the, a lot of those differences, we, we consider them as configurable features that over time, they morph into the same platform uh, that, that we have. And even between public and enterprise, we'll see the lines will start blurring over time. So for example, what's happening with Ethereum 2.0, uh, we envision you know, an environment that you can define a shard, you uh, fix the validators for that, those shards, and eventually, use the, uh, some sort of gateway, you know, to interact with beacon chain. So while you are isolating your shard and chain, uh, you have the opportunity to connect to a public uh, type of, you know, platform. So, so, that's, uh, so that's, uh, that's something that we try to convey to this uh, organization. Not to, too much, you know, stuck with having a shared ledger, looking at the bigger picture of the platform, like the crypto economics, you know, uh, embedded native, you know, uh, token, you know, that, that's established in the platform, the, the coordination and consensus, you know, protocol, the importance of them to make their uh, choice future-proof over time. But in addition to that, uh, we, we think um, 
So organizations need to also look at uh, uh, areas beyond just having the uh, pure blockchain platform, and that's you know things like decentralized web. Uh, at Gartner, we believe that in the vision of decentralized web, I think it, it's a key element of supporting uh, digital ecosystems uh, moving forward. Uh, so without having that fabric, you know, to do trust verification between all sorts of entities, uh, the, the having that vision of digitalization in an ecosystem was almost impossible. So, so decentralized web is coming, and then from a platform perspective, if, if the platform has a limited vision, uh, it cannot support decentralized web. So uh, that's another la layer that needs to be factored as part of the decision. Uh, so, and even we push it further in terms of long-term planning, like 10 years, 15 years down the road, this concept of worldwide ledger, you know, that we are going to have uh, a new kind of a muted version of worldwide web that uh, basically connect all these ledgers together, you know, with new type of uh, identification methods, new type of, you know, objects, uh, new type of protocols um, that we try to convey. Um, and the whole idea is to uh, help the organizations to understand, you know, where are we going with all of these technologies. Sometimes, you know, uh, uh, as developers, we may focus too much on the bits and bytes, you know, and uh, miss on the bigger picture, which is important for them, you know, to build a case to adopt this type of technology. So, so that's the idea, you know, as some uh, kind of, you know, hopefully pointers, you know, as you want building in all these great systems, you know, to convey it in a way that they can relate to and adopt it over time. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to Japan. My name is Ryunosuke Nagayama. I'm a master's student at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. Today, I would like to talk about a network simulator called Shimbrook. Network is uh, one of the important things for us. Uh, so blockchain is based on P2P network, so it's necessary to consider communication within the network. For example, when you want to improve the blockchain throughput, you will increase the block size and the block number of blocks generated per second. But however, uh, this increases the block propagation delay and shortens the block generation time. So the, it's, uh, it becomes difficult to synchronize blockchain uh, in network, and it triggers the chain forks. So like this, uh, network communication is a cause of security degradation on blockchain. So we research the uh, improving as a method for improving the blockchain networks, but it's difficult to experiment with real networks. So we, we developed a blockchain network simulator, so, uh, and we, we call it Shimbrook. Shimbrook simulates uh, blockchain uh, protocols and block propagation. Uh, by default, uh, blockchain using proof of work and longest through uh, on random networks. But if you want to test your new idea, you can design the node behavior network topology, and network configuration to fit your ideas. And you can get the various data from Shimbrook. This data can be used for net, uh, network measurement and attack analysis and so on. Uh, and this, this simulator was used for uh, some experiment about uh, net new neighbor selection algorithm and measuring the effect of relay networks. So, and now, Simbrook uh, supports Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Dogecoin. And we are developing for Ethereum support. But there are many Ethereum projects, so, such as Casper, Plasma. So, this time, I simulated Ghost on Simbrook as a sample experiment. Ghost is a block selection protocol. The current Ethereum protocol selects the longest chain as main chain. But instead, uh, Go selects the heaviest chain. Heaviest chain means uh, a subtree with the most blocks. So I tried to measuring the effect of Ghost protocol against selfish mining. 
This is an uh, interim result. The left shows the ratio of the attacker's blocks in main chain, corresponding to the attacker's mining power. This shows how much mining power is needed for selfish mining. And uh, light shows the uh, average length of the, uh, of the chain released by the attacker. Uh, this is related to the safe number of confirmation. Uh, this, uh, in both results, is, uh, shows the ghost is better than the longest rule, but it's not as much as I expected. This is probably because uh, Ethereum has, has not much, so much folks. So I think uh, if... Uh, Ma, uh, it, it ghost is uh, better, uh, more efficient with the more forked blockchain. So as this experiment, uh, Simbrook will help you to evaluate some Eastern protocols. Uh, please try Simbrook and, uh, and give us feedback. You, if you, if you are interested in the Shimbrook, you can get more information and code on our website or GitHub. Thank you for listening. Please enjoy DevCon and Osaka.